Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our uh, uh, virtual roundtable where we discuss all things related to the Beatles, both as a group and in their solo careers, their their history, their present, uh, and their uh, their future. Uh, in fact, we're waiting for news about. Uh, uh, their something future. their their future that you may uh, you may know by the time uh, by the time this airs. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beetle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. Uh, first of all, the host of the uh, syndicated Beatles radio show Every Little Thing, and that's Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hey, Al. How's it going? Good. How about you? Very good. Good. And our resident musicologist and uh, longtime classical music reviewer for the New York Times still does classical music reviews up in uh, his new domain in Portland, Maine. And uh, and that's uh, Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hello, Al. How are you doing? And hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least, uh, as Alan calls him, the world's uh, the world's only remaining full time Beatles journalist. And he writes for uh, uh, freelance work for for uh, Billboard magazine and for AXS dot com, axes dot com, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. Now we're going to be discussing the huge package that just came out within the last ten days of um, Paul McCartney's "Flowers in the Dirt" album. Uh, the latest uh, installment in his archive collection, but first we have a couple of a uh, couple of news items, and as uh, so often seems to be the case, they're uh, they're unhappy ones, and uh, I'll let Steve uh, take that. The first one is something that that I got to cover on Billboard the other day. It's the passing of uh, Rosie Hamlin, uh, the lead singer of the group Rosie in the originals. And the reason that that uh, is even being mentioned here is because of the fact that the song that she did, Angel Nate, was a uh, a big favorite of John Lennon's. And in fact, for the story, I got got a hold of May Pang. And she told about how she and John both loved the song and it was that discussion that kind of led to him doing the song. And it wasn't released uh, on the Rock and Roll album, but it was released later on the Men Love Avenue album. But uh, John loved the song, and, and and he actually does kind of a spoken introduction where he says, this is one of my favorite songs. Uh, you can barely hear it over the introduction, but he's but he, he talks in there. So Wasn't it was on a, Roots? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, was. It, was it was on Roots too, but yeah. I mean it, that mm-hmm. wasn't. But it, in terms of uh, commercial albums, uh, which I mm. guess you can call Roots commercial, but I, yeah, it was gray market. Uh, let's put it that gray way. market. Yeah, but anyway, but and yeah, also it, it, also when the rock and roll mm-hmm. album was reissued in the two thousands, it was yes. one of the bonus tracks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's true, and it is, and even without you know John Lennon's admiration for the song it was a one one of the classic songs of the 50s one of the if if there's i guess a one hit wonder definition i guess it's kind of <laughs> you'd help to give it to rosie in the originals although it has one of the worst sax solos ever committed to record <laughs> that is it's awful <laughs> they uh, according to the story that uh that she told they did it in an airplane air, airplane hangar mm-hmm. um so it was really done under not so great conditions sure so well, in those days a lot of records were made under <laughs> less right. than great conditions right right mm-hmm. so and and john, that, john brought up the song on wnew when scott muni interviewed him that that's and right I, you know and he just told scott i love that song i love it you know and i think mm-hmm. scott was surprised that he liked it Mm-hmm. 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 Anyway, um, the uh, the main subject at hand is this gigantic box that I have in front of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it uh, called "Flowers in the Dirt." It's the latest in the Paul McCartney archive collection, and uh, we're going to go through the the entire box 
and uh, give our thoughts on uh, on on each of the elements. We probably should start with the um, uh, with the main the main album, right? Why don't we start with the box itself first? You want to you, should we do that? We could. Uh, why don't we start? Yeah, I would say say let's start with the box itself because that's there's uh, it's an interesting. I mean, we've seen the other boxes, and in terms of what the box contains besides the CDs, there's some nice stuff in here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, abs- absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and since people and- have been complaining, you know, for a couple of months since it was announced that I don't want to pay all that money for a book, you know, I mean, there's the stuff in here really is exceptional, and it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's called a deluxe box, <laughs> so, you know, you for kind a of, reason. Yeah, you and you kind of expect something extra, and I think that the stuff he's come up with. You know, to give us as the extras in this, or uh, you know, I mean, I, I buy books too, so maybe it's uh, maybe it's not as much of an issue for me. But um, you know, really good stuff. Where should yeah, we start? The, even well, the mm. like for instance, the uh, the the flowers in the dirt and this one photo photo books are you know they're very interesting. Mm-hmm. They're pretty to look at, but actually the core items. Are really the uh, the 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 book that has a you know a reproduction of Paul's composing notebook, uh, very similar to what Bruce Springsteen did uh, for his Darkness on the, on the Edge of Town mm-hmm. uh, box set, and then of course mm-hmm. the main the main Flowers in the in the Dirt book, which right. has uh, not only a treasure trove of photos, uh, a lot of which I've never seen. But mm-hmm. also an essay by uh, by Dylan Jones and much interview material, mm-hmm. especially regarding the McCartney and uh, uh, Cost- uh, the McCartney Costello collaborations. Mm-hmm. So, Alan, what uh, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, and this book is 113 pages, not counting the covers, and uh, <laughs> and well, I don't know. Some of these people count them. Um, <clears throat> You know, and it's it's really got you know lots of as you say photos and info. Um, I was really taken also with the sort of notebook what he calls it uh, rough book, where he's mm-hmm. got the lyrics and you know and we've seen McCartney's handwritten and sort of adorned with drawings lyrics you know over the years. But you know if you're really interested in these songs. These things really offer all sorts of possibilities for study of, you know, I mean, uh, apart from things where words are crossed out and new words are written in, which is, uh, I always love to see that, you know, yeah, and he's got, you know, where there's a bridge, (laughs) drawn in a picture of a bridge on some of them and, and some of his caricatures and things like that. But, but also, I mean, you know, just for me, the, the stuff that's crossed out and moved around and, you know, arrows pointing where this verse now is going to go. And like, Mm -hmm. that's all, uh, all fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I just love seeing manuscripts, um, you know, I don't know if um, listeners might remember, but there used to be there was once a Monty Python book where it had oh, yeah. you know manuscripts mm-hmm. from you know Shakespeare and the great poets, and you know it, you'd you'd see uh, Shakespeare like writing saying you know eeny meeny miny mo, and it's crossed out, and it says <laughs> shall I compare thee to a summer's day written over, <laughs> <laughs> but you know and and so uh, yeah like but this is this is like that but a little more serious, and uh, you know he's got the chords written in and stuff like that and. And, uh, mm-hmm. So you know, there's that. Then the 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 uh, this one book, I think you know. I mean, they've they've made an effort here. You know, this one had two promos, which are included on the DVD, and so mm-hmm. you have a book that opens both ways. You know, two different ways. It's kind of hard to describe, but it's it's like uh, the connection is a almost like an accordion kind of thing where you look at the book from one direction and it's the uh, sort of uh, Indian kind of promo of this one and and the other one is the you know the more modern psychedelic promo of this one with you know I, with, I wonder I wonder if that that uh, uh, caused somebody to have nightmares when Paul said yeah why don't we open the book two different ways <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right Right. Yeah, and then the you know the flowers in the dirt photos or your paintings. I guess they're Linda's photos of mm-hmm. 
I love yeah. those. They're, I they're quite nice, and the, and they've done the the box that way too, which is the first time they've. Um, you know, you look at all the boxes on the shelf. There, you know, some ones blue, ones red, but mostly they're you know plain boxes um, with the photo of the cover on the front. This one has the flowers and the dirt photo sort of all around it, um, mm-hmm. so that it's it's it, it stands out on the shelf. You know, very colorfully. I, right. I just, I just think the whole thing is beautifully done. You know, so. it really is. That it whole really process is. is called chibachrome. Is it chibachrome or sebachrome? What they use for the front cover? Mm. Those flowers? Don't, don't know. You know, yeah. They do describe it, and they they explain the whole process. I think it's pronounced. It's either chibachrome or sebachrome. It's seb- right. it's sebachrome. I'm looking at okay. the back of the, the. It's in the back of the book. Yeah. And, it's C-I-B-A-C-H-R-O-M-E. Oh, right. Mm. Yeah. And this is so, – the book is of an exhibition of these of these that, that took place in 1989 at the Mayor Gallery. I guess it must be in London. Mm-hmm. Mm. But, um, yeah. And it also serves to show, as Paul has done many times – Linda's work as an artist. Um, yeah. He's, I mean, as a photographer and a, and an artist, uh, that he's something, you know, it's something that he's he's always been, you know, he's done several uh, exhibits and things and put out books and stuff, and he continues to honor her that way. So that's that's cool too. Mm-hmm. I so. think the reason why the books are so important for Paul to put into all these box sets is because it is his own way of keeping Linda's legacy alive. Mm-hmm. And making yeah. the public aware of her fine ph- uh, photography. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's so many photos through the years. Imagine all the archives of what he has oh, that God. we've never oh. seen before. Yeah. And this is really <laughs> probably just a small sampling of it. Mm-hmm. So think about all the work going through all the photos and picking which ones deserve to be put into these books. Yeah. So. I mean, if, and if I were getting a you know a deluxe edition that was just the recordings, I mean, yeah, it would be okay. But I, but this makes these productions, I think, really special. And you know, and you could buy the you could buy the stripped down edition with. I mean, you know, I, I wish there was a middle way so that people who really, really don't want the books for whatever reason could get all of the discs. You know, the only way mm. you can get all of the discs is in the set with all the books. But but you know, that's that's what it is. Yeah, know. yeah. Uh, Ken, did you get much of a chance to dig into the uh, the you know the main book, the the flowers in the dirt book? Yeah, in fact, I just finished reading it, and I really love it. Uh, mainly because of the fact that almost all the parties involved with the album are quoted here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you not only have Paul and Elvis, but you have some of the musicians. I know there's a few quotes from Hamish Stewart and Robbie McIntosh. And uh, Chris Witten. I don't believe there's anything from from Wix in there. He must be the quiet one in this mm. band. <laughs> Since that's the one but, he's uh, still working with, you would think that he had access. <laughs> yeah, to that's, that's yeah, true. really. But also the different producers and their own uh, you know, their own angles of you know what it was like to work with Paul. I think it's very well rounded there. And towards the end of the book, Paul also puts in the articles that appeared in Club Sandwich. Which was, you know, through the fan club, mm-hmm. four times a year you would get issues of their newsletter. So you not only get quotes from Paul today talking about it, but it's also interesting to hear what was said back then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I like it from, from that angle. There's a lot of things that I found interesting in that book. In particular, Elvis Costello says that Paul may not remember this, but about 12 or 13 years ago, he was contemplating releasing the demos as an album. Mm-hmm. He actually says this in the book. Elvis was or, or Paul? Elvis said that Paul was considering. Oh, it. OK. OK. Mm. okay. And um, the engineer, I think it's Neil Dorfman. It's Mitchell Froome's engineer, had said that Paul had handed him some dat tapes of some 30 unreleased songs that were very good <laughs> that I guess weren't used on Flowers in the Dirt. So, you know. Love to hear those, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe they ended up on off the ground. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Al- uh, Alan, to respond to one thing that Alan said, Alan, you can get the special, edi- the two disc special edition in MP3. Just so, the two disc, right? Yeah, well, but, but you, can't get, words, you can't get you can't get all words, four. You can't get, in no. other words, the 
I think you no, just you get can... the demos, but not the studio production. Um, right. Elvis Costello things. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to point out, um, uh, you know, that magazine, web magazine, Super Deluxe Edition. Has, has anyone mm-hmm. everyone seen that? Um, they have a huge article about flowers that also interviews all the producers. Um, right. And and it's you know currently up and um, I think it's you know that's something I think we should point out to everyone. Uh, People also did a good two articles, um, one interviewing McCartney and Elvis, and the other going through all the songs that they did together, mm-hmm. um, which is also a good, uh, also something that people should uh, look up and and um, make note of. Yeah, mm-hmm. Jeff Slate did an interview with Elvis Costello. Right, right. Where mm-hmm. he talked about the songs that the two of them wrote together. And in yeah. fact, if anyone's interested, on my website, I have a page called Important Links. And I posted the links for all these different articles on Flowers in the Dirt. Mm-hmm. And they're all in there. And so, I think, I think uh, an expanded version of Jeff Slate's yep. is coming out in Beatle Fan. Uh, right, yep, Mr. Exactly. Executive Editor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, the the man above me has uh, has made that decision, and uh, yeah, it will be in uh, will be in the next issue. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and also I just want to say that, mm-hmm. and I've said this before, I, I am a real sucker for handwritten lyrics. I think that um, the fact that Paul shares these with us, the fact that he saves them, I love the fact that he does that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just looks like he just handed it to you after you wrote it. And in fact, some of them were written in pencil. And you can tell because they're so lightly written. And some mm-hmm. of the pages even have a stain on them. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, right. And there's even a letter that Elvis wrote to Paul in the back there mm-hmm. that was shortly after they had started writing together. Just, you know, kind of thanking him for working together. He's looking forward to doing more, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But just mm-hmm. the fact that's all, you know, you feel like you're part of, you're sharing, like, you know, some privacy here of what happened early on. So uh, I just love, like Alan said, I love looking at the handwritten lyrics, what gets crossed out, or also lyrics that uh, were written down here that weren't used. I I love that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And between that and recently, you know, looking at the new I Me Mind book Mm. with George's handwritten lyrics Mm -hmm. and all that we went through with uh, John's handwritten lyrics that were in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, some of which have been reproduced in the the, um, yeah, and the reissues on CD uh, from the, in the 2000s. There was a few songs, I think, that had handwritten lyrics from John. I love mm-hmm. that stuff. Mm-hmm. I eat it all up. And any time that there's any lyrics in there that weren't in the final version, you know, I find that fascinating. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Very true. Steve, any uh, any other thoughts on the uh, what you might call the the paper material? On the paper material? Um, no, not really. I mean that I like I said that it's funny that they did that one book kind of half backwards and forwards. It, it, you can just kind of see somebody going, "No, not that," you know. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. there's some beaut- there is some beautiful stuff in in there. I. I I agree that that the notebook is really fascinating to go through. The one that caught my I, and also the the purple book, which has the is the main really the main book. But the one that really caught my attention was the the Linda photos of the cover photos. That is mm-hmm. just that is just really nice. I you know uh, you really uh, it's it, you really miss Linda a lot when you you know you start thinking about how talented she was and and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and looking at that, you know, that just kind of brings it all out. So I think that's a really cool part mm-hmm. of that uh, part of that paper material. But uh, I mean, we've you know, as we've said, there's a lot in there to really like. So mm-hmm. that kind of reminds me. I kind of wish that in the the actual flowers in the dirt book with the text in it, that there would have been one or two quotes from Linda to represent her, but there weren't. Mm. Mm. I guess maybe the feeling is that uh, that the photos are really, you know, kind of representing her her voice. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't she? Uh, and I can't remember now because I, I looked at it a couple of times. Isn't she in the in the documentary? Isn't she in put, uh, put it there? So I mean, doesn't she say a few? I things? don't think she has any. Uh, she doesn't talk. No, she doesn't, talk. doesn't have any comments. Just uh, you know, just the, the the video that was done in the studio, uh, her with the band. 
Uh, right. Um, and she may have, you know, just said a couple of things, but nothing, you know, sort of on camera. I, well, you know. see, I remember it when they're shooting, I think, isn't it this one? She tells Hamish to flap his wings a little more. That, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that that's one part. But, I mean, yeah, it's just too bad that they that she actually didn't comment at all. But it, that's a nice tribute that, that she's in there. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, we probably then should uh, get on with the music. And uh, well, uh, why don't we start with the the main disc? Okay. Okay? Okay. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> all right. And I'll, well, I'll dive in first. All right. Because sure. I did uh, a, a uh, infamously uh, bad review of, infamous, uh, infamous. of Fla- of Flowers in the Dirt back in 1989, so bad that Bill King ended up having to do a uh, a counterpoint positive review. Mm. Now I've 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 walked back on this a couple of times in the years since, uh, both in Beetle Fan and also on the uh, the you know the Something New blog site. But uh, you know I've, I've really have not listened to this album in in quite some time actually, and. Uh, Ken hates this when I do this, but I'm going to say that this album has aged very, very well. You know, music, music is capable. Help me out here, Mr. Cozen. Uh, <laughs> music is capable of aging well and or, yeah, that's or, sure. not, or not so well. <laughs> well, you know, it, it hasn't it hadn't for a long time was looked at, it was looked down upon. Was it really went through? I thought I thought it was. I thought it was. It really had a. Uh, uh, there was not a lot of appreciation for it for hmm. for a long. You know the way things the way things go in in I wouldn't say recent years after, but it, it seemed like there was a long time where people really didn't think that much of it. Interesting. And, and mm. I mean, I seem to remember it, people liking it. Um. Mm. But you know, it was the it was the first of his records that I reviewed for the Times because um, it was like shortly after the Times Beatles desk got established, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and and we were we were actually trying to do an interview with him about it instead of a review, and um, it was getting so hard to pin him down um, through his publicist that we finally just said. Let's just review the record, you know, and I, and I really liked it. I mean, I thought it had, you know, all these – it had kind of a running theme, you know, about marriage and mm-hmm. children and, you know, and parents. I mean, put it there. I mean, it, it just had all of these connections that seemed to hang together really well with things I didn't like about some of it. I mean, not that crazy about Rough Ride, not even that crazy about Figure of Eight as a song – and I think I've said several times what I think of Ule was away. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, yeah. but the rest of it. You know. So, um, yeah, but I don't want to interrupt. Uh, Al was still that's, doing that, his. That's okay. Well, that, that's from okay. what I, from mm-hmm. what I recall, when the album came out, it, it got mainly positive reviews. Mm-hmm. I don't remember mm-hmm. it getting bashed. Well, except for Al. Except for me. <laughs> <laughs> was this, was this worse than somewhere in England? Uh, yes. Uh, what was no, it that you disliked no. about it, Al? Um, I, I, I basically sloughed it off as being pleasant. Hmm. You know, that it didn't have, it didn't really have much to it. You know, I, I think I particularly pointed at Distractions as a track that, you know, was just hmm. pleasant. And actually, that's one of the tracks that has, at least to me, has kind of aged best. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a lovely song and, and just overall, especially in stark contrast to its immediate predecessor, press to play, you know, mm-hmm. which just, you know, screams eighties, right. um, this, this album, as I said, I feel has, has aged, uh, extremely well. Obviously the core of it is the, the four, McCartney Costello collaborations, mm-hmm. uh, but but also you've got distractions and you've got We Got Married, which is uh, used for the you know one for the one tour as the instead of Let Me Roll It mm-hmm. as kind of the uh, the big arena rock 
climax of the first set before Paul would sit down at the piano. How many people? Is is a is a wonderful song, especially these days when reggae is so prevalent, even in top forty land, uh, and obviously things like this one and put it there, which are, you know, kind of standard uh, pieces in in the McCartney catalog. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think just overall, I, I think it just it melds together, it falls together very, uh, very nicely, and as I said, has. Uh, has has aged very well. Mm-hmm. And My Can't, Brave Face, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, not yeah, only the oh, yeah. lead single, mm-hmm. but the opening track. I mean, I, that song to me, I, I just love that song. I mean, it's it's yeah, got everything too. about it musically, lyrically, the, you know, mm-hmm. I think the, com- the Costello-McCartney uh, M- combination there really works out well. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just, I think, a, a, a great song. And I loved the video that came out, partly because, you know, all the little Beatles memorabilia things in sure. it. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think, yeah. you know, at the time, uh, you know, people might have thought, okay, you know, this is this is one of the things that he frequently did, especially after this. This might have been one of the first, but it's like it's reminding everybody that um, – Yes, the Beatles, that was me, you know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but nevertheless, I mean, I thought it was cool bringing all that memorabilia out of his, um, you know, safe and having mm-hmm. it filmed mm-hmm. and, and having also like a little narrative. There's a little narrative going on there of this Japanese collector trying to get his hands on the stuff. And uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of cool. But the song mm-hmm. was just great. The song was. Oh, great. yeah. Mm-hmm. And and in fact, if uh, I I forgot to look it up, but I believe it actually charted higher than any of the three singles that were on Press to Play. Well, that's not surprising because they were, you know, not as well, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So when do I when do I insert yeah, please, my opinion uh, here? <laughs> yes, please. Well, I have no problem at all with you praising Flowers and Dirt because I've said it's it's my favorite McCartney album now because McCartney always represents variety in his music and strong melodies and very often strong lyrics, not always. This album has all of that, and especially I love the lyrics when Paul and Elvis write together. Very odd lyrics, but very strong lyrics. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of dark lyrics, too, like That Day Is Done. Mm-hmm. There's such a, a rich variety on Flowers in the Dirt. But the only problem that I have, and I think that for anyone who might be a new listener to this show, in case they're questioning about this concept of aging well, mm-hmm. I, I have a, a huge problem with anyone saying that certain music has aged well and certain music hasn't. Because as far as I'm concerned, and I've defended Press to Play, I don't mind the 80s sound. And I don't mind all the drum machines and uh, the synthesizers and whatever they used in the 80s. I think it worked very well on Press to Play for the kind of sound that Paul was striving for then. And when people say that was the sound of the time, which Paul said, actually, in Mm -hmm. a recent interview, you know, uh, he said that he was going for the flavor of the month. Well, you know, throughout uh, the 80s on up. He's been working with various producers who happen to be hot producers of the time, you know. So if you go back to even something like the new album, he's got Mark Ronson on there, who's one of the hottest producers of the time. He's working with Adele's producer now. So he's doing the same kind of work, working with producers that he admires from current music of the time that he likes. He should be proud of that. But my point is, is that Flowers in the Dirt doesn't have that very much of its time sound to it. It has a much more timeless feel to it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like an 80s album. But right. even if something came out in the 80s, I don't just say it's 80s. I like it now. The same right, way- but there are some things that sound 80s and there are some yes. things that don't. You know, that just sound, as Al says, timeless. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think you can take an album and criticize the hasn't aged well idea just across the board and say you know it's not valid i think it is valid under certain circumstances not with this album i agree and i and 
to kind of get it. I, I think, Al, I might have picked up on what you had written kind of about my feeling about the album. But it seemed to me that for a long time, Flowers got got a bad feeling. Although I will say that it was the first uh, album during which I saw McCartney because I saw him on that uh, tour. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and I, that made a difference seeing them do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, There's several uh, of the songs on there benefited. Figure of Eight is probably the greatest example of mm-hmm. a song that benefited from its live performance, especially since that was the, the last time that Paul began, uh, began a concert tour with, as its opener, a song other than a Beatles song. Mm-hmm. In other words, beginning with the beginning with the '93 tour, he has always, you know, ever since then, he's opened his show with a Beatles song. And and you know those shows. I mean, I saw the the show in Berkeley. I, it was not either ninety. I think it was ninety ninety or ninety one. I can't remember what year now. 90. But that was a great. I, I I have it somewhere, and I I don't remember what the what. But it, I mean, it was a great show. It mm-hmm. was a really, it was a really great show, um, and, and there's a soundboard bootleg of it around. Yes, yes, there is. <laughs> yes, I, there I, is. I think, yeah. I think we, I don't know if we've discussed it on the air, off the, on the air, but we have talked about it on the air, and it's a great quality. And that actually kind of leads to something I was going to say a little later, which I'll hold off saying now. But right, well, I'll tell you what. Let me just because I interrupted Ken. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me just let me just let him complete his thought. All right. Just the, the simple fact that when I hear the songs from Press to Play, I don't just say to myself, oh, that's the 80s. It sounds like a good song now to me. And there are a lot of songs right now that use some of the same kind of production. So I don't just think that it's dated. And I don't even think if a song sounds dated, there's anything that bad with it. I mean, when I listen to early Beatles music, when I listen to She Loves You, I know that wasn't recorded today, and I know that there's nothing that's out today that sounds anything like it. But that doesn't make me think less of it. So this whole idea of what's aged well, it just I, I don't process that at all. You can tell, I remember we, we had a conversation like this many shows back, and you were saying certain things like Band on the Run sounds contemporary. Well, if Ben on the Run never came out in 1973, and it came out today, and it sounded exactly like that, I could tell you that was produced in the 70s. Well, obviously, there are technical there are technical aspects of it that are you know that are from the 70s, but especially uh-huh. especially in the case of Band on the Run, because of the fact that it was you know there were only the three uh, the three people and plus a few you know s- some session uh, some session musicians involved, uh, you know it's it, you know there's not a lot of there's not a lot of production going on. Let's put it that way. I'm talking in terms of production and also songwriting. I don't hear anything that's out there today that sounds like Band on the Run. So you know that it's from well, another time, yeah, but I, I don't think any less of it for that. The same way I don't think any less of Press to Play. Right, but you know that I, you have a much more liberal viewpoint than I think maybe <laughs> either the rest of us do or a lot of other people do. Well, thank you, and I'm I, proud of it. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's, that's absolutely. Al right. may also be ha- having having a, a, a sort of uh, a different approach to aging well, which is that he hated Flowers in the Dirt when it came out, and now he thinks it's really pretty good. So it's aged mm-hmm. well in that way. Whereas Press to Play wasn't very good when it came out, and it isn't very good now. <laughs> actually, I don't, I don't agree with that. I know. You actually, don't. I liked I liked Press to Play a lot more. Back then, and then when when we when we did a show on it uh, relatively recently, and I listened to it in context for the first time in quite a while, mm-hmm. and heard those you know those tracks that sound like Phil Collins should be singing them instead of Paul. Um, <laughs> why, why do you say that? Paul has the same right to do those same kind of songs. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean We're it's fine. Ding, ding. Well, Only love remains is great, but. Yeah. Yes. Are we getting sidetracked yes. onto? A- yes, we are. Side- yes. Getting sidetracked. Right. You were talking. Yeah. You were going to be talking about flowers in the dirt. 
Well, Flowers in the Dirt, like I said, is, is a very strong album from start to finish. I love every single aspect of it. You know, most McCartney albums, even the ones that I would rate a 10 out of 10, might have something slightly wrong with it. You know, there are certain McCartney albums where I, th I think certain songs go on too long. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the case of Flowers in the Dirt, I would say that about Motor of Love, which I think goes on mm -hmm. a little bit too long. Yeah. But mm -hmm. still, all the songs, there's such variety. I mean, when I first listened to Flowers in the Dirt, when it, when it first came out, My Brave Face hit me right in the head. Okay. This one. You know, those songs, you know, I instantly liked. And then other songs grew on me. And the one song I just couldn't grasp was Don't Be Careless, Love. Really? And after a while, after a while, I couldn't get that song out of my head. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, it's a very quirky song. And there's nothing else that I've heard Paul do that sounds like that. And obviously, a lot of that is Elvis Costello's mm -hmm. songwriting influence in that, too. But there's so many different styles of music on, on, this, on this album. We Got Married, I think, was brilliant. Distractions is really nice. I mm -hmm. mean, kind of similar in a way to Footprints. It has a yeah. sort of a jazz overtones. Mm -hmm. You know, probably some very odd chords going on mm -hmm. in Distractions as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of unique sounds. And I do love a dance track like Oué Le Soleil. I think it's a good, fun track. <laughs> you know, I like all the different sounds. I'm sorry. I happen to like dance tracks. Hmm. Maybe I don't... We'll Mr. Talk Disco. About, yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Mr. Diverse is more like it. So I like every song on Flowers in the Dirt, and I, I do. It's my favorite album of his. There you go. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. at the time it came mm -hmm. out, and Flower, uh, My Brave Face came out as a single with Flying to My Home on the back. I thought right. Flying to My Home was an incredible track. I mean, it's yes. just beautiful. And I could not understand why you would not put that on the album, but would put Oué Le Soleil on the album. And even some of the mm -hmm. others, Rough Ride, you know, whatever. Um, mm. And so I asked him. And uh, when, I, when I interviewed him like a year later, when um, Trip in the Live Fantastic came out, I, I said, I don't really understand how this works. I mean, you've got an incredible track like that. That's better than some of the tracks on the album. I don't think I singled out Oué Le Soleil because I didn't want to, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, why, <laughs> does, why does that happen? And, and he said, well, you know, I, I, I write them all, you know, so I like them all. And I don't really know how to judge, you know, which ones are best. So I play them for my kids and their friends, and I sort of go with what they seem to like. Which I thought was kind of you know weird, but um, you know you're supposed to mm -hmm. either have some sort of editorial overview or this, as I think uh, Lawrence Juber said last last week when we talked to him, mm -hmm. this this is why someone has a producer. You know, the mm -hmm. producer is supposed to say no, this one, not that one. You know, this one. <laughs> Uh, right. But he had he had several producers on Flowers. Yeah, but you need an overall producer who will. Say, well, I mean, actually, the producers he was using might have liked Uwe Le Soleil for all I know, and maybe didn't like Fly Flying to My Home. But uh, you well, know, it, yeah, that article that you were referring to before, where you heard from all the producers mm -hmm. from Flowers in the Dirt, mm -hmm. it was Steve Lipson, who was working with Trevor Horn, who I believe said that he thought Rough Ride would have made the best single better than My Brave Face. Yeah. So that's what one other producer or engineer, that, that was his opinion. So, yeah. you know, you obviously wouldn't agree with that. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has their own opinion. And I know Paul has said, because we've talked about this before, sometimes he goes to his kids and he asks them what they think of his music. So maybe he takes their advice as well. Yeah, it's possible. Possible. That's what, he, what he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do not think this is the be all end all album that Ken does, but I do I do think it has definitely grown in my estimation since it came out. Maybe I took it for a little too much for granted back then, but in listening to it all again, I was you know, I was caught up by it and I am not a people who know me know I'm not a McCartney cheerleader. Not that I'm saying any, but any of us are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 
I am not, and I do like this album an awful lot. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's it's very strong. I don't think every track is perfect. Um, what don't you think is perfect? What don't I think is perfect? Um, yeah. How many people is not it just doesn't seem to fit in for me. Uh, I don't particularly mm. like the the uh, uh, like that. No, but specifically, what what don't you like about it not fitting in? You like reggae, right? The re- no, not 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 well, not there. I don't think it fits in there. I, you know, reggae is fine, except I don't think it fits in on the album very well with the the mood of the rest of the album. I, I just don't think it works that well. Except uh, except that, as Ken said, there were there are so many as musical genres represented on this album. Well, I, I, I agree. You I know, just like reggae I said, was just one of them. Right. For me, though, it just uh, how many people just doesn't seem to work that well but i mean i like i like the others and and uh listening again listening to the album again brought back memories number one of seeing him do some of this stuff live Mm -hmm. and also just the you know my brave face has always been one of these songs that i've always loved that has Mm -hmm. never been in question that's one of my all-time favorite mccartney songs probably because of the beatley thing that you know that seems to be happening there Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I love that song a lot. Rough Ride also. Huh. Um, probably grew. I probably grew to like that after I heard them do it in in Berkeley. Um, uh, you know, Distractions uh, is good. We got. I remember he he did. We got married that night in in Berkeley also, and right. and I, I like that. Figure of Eight was one of the best songs he did live that night. If I'm referring to the live. Thing. There's a. I mean, I, I just enjoyed that show an awful lot. And yeah. Well. Well. Like I said, I, I think that the, I, uh, and the same thing happened with uh, Venus and Mars. Mm-hmm. Uh, the live versions of songs from that album that Paul did on the '75 and '76 uh, tours definitely uh, kind of upgraded those songs in the estimation of a lot of people. All right. And I think. And I. I, I actually think that the live versions. Of this uh, of this album, did more for this album than the ones from Venus and Mars. I think I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe you guys want I, I don't know if you want to you want to argue that, but I yeah I do I do because I I mean the and the, but they're great songs in in themselves and and I don't want to make it sound like I'm detracting from the album at all. Uh, I mean this is uh, there's no question this is. A great album. There's no no question about it. Yeah. It's a kind. It's the kind of stuff that where you you would have figured that if he were to like put out like just theoretically a four disc set of his like best favorite stuff, that some of these songs would be on it, right? Exactly. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cousin. Yes, I, I, yeah. absolutely. I wonder why he didn't do that. There are at least three or four songs on here that probably would have belonged on an album. You know, say an album that he could have called, uh, oh, I don't know, Pure McCartney. Pure McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. That probably would have sold a lot more had it had you know had it uh, had he done that. Well, maybe he could have a download only fifth disc with. <laughs> this is true. Uh-huh. <laughs> with just just those those four songs. There we go. But we just go. going back to an idea that you just brought up, Al, and I do agree, mm-hmm. and, and Steve and I talked about this when it was just him and me doing the show, but I would go even further and say that during the Wings Over America tour, the songs from Band on the Run, Venus and Mars and Wings at the Speed of Sound, many of them translated better live mm-hmm. than yes. in the studio. I always yeah. loved the studio versions, too, and mm-hmm. certainly in the case of Flowers in the Dirt, Figure of Eight is is much better as a live oh, song. I think so, too. I, Massively know, better. It, it loses its guts in the studio version mm-hmm. to the point where the the um, the Bob Clear Mountain mix, the twelve inch mix, is so much better than the one that's on the album. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, so ab- absolutely, and the and the video uh, which is included on the uh, on the DVD, which was uh, you know I think I think put out. Because of the fact that the that the the song had gotten such positive reaction along the tour, mm. uh, it was uh, you know it was it was really almost made to seem as if it was a live recording, you know even though it was the you know uh, mm-hmm. you know the the studio recording, mm-hmm. right? You know? And 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 I remember one of the, one of the memories. And I, I don't know if I've mentioned this on the air before, but I do remember saying it to you guys. One of my memories of seeing Paul in Berkeley was. 
during figure of eight hearing Linda yell, yeah, <laughs> near the end of the song. And that, that version, that record, the whole recording, the whole concert is, is floating around out there in a great soundboard uh, version. And you can hear Linda clear as a bell uh, saying that. And I remember we were sitting way at the back of Berkeley Memorial stadium and I, you couldn't, you couldn't miss it. You couldn't miss mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So, yeah. Matter of fact, I remember seeing Hamish Stewart and Robbie McIntosh appear at the um, at the Chicago Beetle Fest in I think it may have been maybe like ninety nine somewhere mm-hmm. in that neighborhood, and they did um, and they you know came on stage and played with uh, played with Liverpool uh, and Mitch Wiseman at that point was in was. A member of Liverpool, and so of course was doing all of Paul's uh, songs, mm-hmm. and they did Figure of Eight, and I swear I got chills. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was, it was, re- it was really a you know a magic, a magic, magic moment. Oh. You know? and uh, yeah, it it worked very very well. Mm. Yeah. I remember I remember Hamish appearing at Beetlefest. I don't remember him doing that, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, well, uh, ha- yeah, Hamish. Uh, Hamish did one by himself, but this was uh, Hamish and uh, and, and Rob. Okay. Uh, in, yeah. In fact, actually, I th- I think, if I recall, I think Hamish appeared very very briefly there, just on like on Sunday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Or early Sunday evening, uh, and uh, and and played with Liverpool. Uh, he did. And, La- he did Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if if Robbie did Los Angeles too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember because I remember attending um, the one with Hamish uh, in Los Angeles, but I don't remember that Robbie was there. He may have been, but I don't recall it's it. Poss- very possible. Right. Very possible. Right. Yeah. It'd be nice to bring him back. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> especially yeah. with Flowers of the Dirt coming out like this, and uh, and mm-hmm. Chris Witten, Chris Witten for that matter. There's a thought, Mister uh, Sussman. Well, you know, we, we've talked about that, and you know, because really, especially at this. In fact, I think we talked about it on the uh, the Fest wrap up show uh, that. With having four members of Wings at the New York Fest, the only living, uh, other than Paul, obviously, the only other living members of Wings who have who have not appeared at a fest are, in fact, Chris Witten and uh, Jeff Britton. No, Chris Witten was not in Wings. You're talking. You're thinking of Joey. Uh, 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 not. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Not not Wings, but uh, uh, Paul's uh, uh, Paul's what I call as I call it the Hamish Robbie band. Okay. <laughs> right. You know. Um, he's the. Yep. He's the only. Uh, the only one. Yeah. Actually, I think there are uh, also a couple of uh, well, Wicks, obviously, and Blair Cunningham. Right. I've never done. I've never done a fest. Also. Hmm. Wix would be amazing, considering mm-hmm. all the years that he's worked with Paul now. Yeah, so. I would think that that's not going to happen while he's still working with probably, him. But maybe. Yeah. Probably yeah. not. Probably not. And, uh, and the same, obviously, for the uh, you know the members of Paul's current band. Right. What's cur- what's uh, Witten and and Cunningham doing now? Do you know? Mm, no idea. Yeah, I haven't. I don't think we've heard too much from uh, from either of them. Yeah, we'll go look online. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll have to do that. Anyway, so so moving back to <laughs> to flowers in the dirt. Uh, does anybody else have anything about the album itself before we move on to the other discs? Well, I was wondering what you all thought of the new remaster because I listened to it and I didn't hear that big a difference. No, uh, a little bit more high end, <laughs> a little bit more percussion and drums. There seemed to be a little hotter in the mix, especially on something like Rough Ride. I didn't hear that big a difference sonically. It wasn't so. huge, but it but it it sounded a bit brighter to me. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I didn't do a lot of a being, but I I, I compared a, a, a few tracks to the previous issue, not to the very first, but the you know whatever the last reissue. Um, mm. And it and it did sound a, a bit better, generally speaking. So I I, I didn't continue a being because I, I felt satisfied that you know th- 
this was the one I was going to keep in the playlist, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do wonder how much you can improve some of these recordings that yeah. were at the time. How many multi-track was this? Was this mm -hmm. album? You know, right. they they yeah. had advanced technology then. Yeah, it's much more advanced now. But I mean, it sounded great when it first came out. You can only improve it so much. You mm -hmm. could probably improve yeah. it possibly by remixing, but you know that that opens up other uh, kettles of fish. Um, mm -hmm. So yep. since it's not a remix, I, I think it's you know possibly as good as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and and right. and and especially since the you know the the times uh, span is not as great as it is with say the seventies albums. Mm -hmm. You know, let you know, let alone the let alone the Beatles albums. And by the way, mm -hmm. the the downloads of you know you get the with the box set you can download the whole thing free as as tracks. You know, mm -hmm. obviously yeah. you need it for the. The, the disc with the B-sides anyway and the cassette demos, but, you know, I, I can't see any reason not to download the whole thing, but it also comes as WAV files in, I think, 2496 or 4896. Um, so mm -hmm. they're really sort of high-quality files, higher quality than you're getting on the CD, actually. Mm -hmm. so. And that's another reason to pay the, if you can do it, pay the extra, you know. Yeah. So. All right, right now we are at the halfway point in our analysis of Flowers in the Dirt, the new remastered box set. And we're going to resume more conversation about the box set in our next show, discussing the DVD, the demos of Paul and Elvis, that'll all be in the next show. So before we go, let's give everyone our contact information. First with you, Steve. Uh, well, the, the show you can get a hold of at Things We Said Today, radio show at gmail.com. You can uh, email me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com, and I'm on Facebook. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address at everylittlething at att.net. Don't forget to take a look at my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. I just want to mention very briefly that uh, I have a contest going on for those of you on the East Coast to win tickets to see Denny Lane in concert at Daryl's Place, which is in Pauling, New York. And this particular concert is kind of special because the last few years, he and his band have been performing Band on the Run in their entirety. He's not only doing that album, he's doing the entire first Booty Blues album to go along with it. So if you want to win a pair of tickets, I have three pairs of tickets to give away on my website at the Tickets Giveaways page. And uh, don't forget that you can win flowers in the dirt the special edition on cd or vinyl on my website as well all right so be sure to join us next week for part two of flowers in the dirt the remaster and for steve marinucci al sussman and alan cozen i'm ken michaels thanking you for joining us and we will see you next time <laughs>